Um, I'm Dr. Beverly Coleman, professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm going to talk today on the fetal spine, pearls, and pitfalls. Um, the fetal spine, pearls, and pitfalls. We'd like to begin discussing the pearls. There are very few pearls um, that begin with always, but in the evaluation of the fetal spine, it is important to always try to use more than one transducer. High frequency linear transducers are best to image the spinal cord. It is also important to always try to image in two planes longitudinal, either coronal or sagittal, and then the transverse or axial plane. The spine should be evaluated with the fetus in a prone position and with the spine away from the uterine wall. Today we're going to cover the normal fetal spine, miscellaneous anomalies, pay most attention to neural tube defects, and um, finally uh, conclude with sacral coccygeal teratoma. This slide is an example of a normal spine visualized with a 12 megahertz high frequency probe with the fetus in a prone position. Notice that you can see the um, ossification centers for the two posterior arches, the spinal cord itself, and the ossific ossification center for the body. On the longitudinal view, notice how the ossification centers line up such that the bony structures always uh, extend inferiorly and narrow in the very distal part of the spine. What we know about the ossification uh, of the fetal spine is that the neural arch centers are most important and the pattern of ossification is variable. Uh, we don't know all there is about the cervical and thoracic patterns, but the lumbosacral spine pattern we know ossifies in a caudal direction every 16 weeks with one level at about two to three weeks until the L5 to S1, S5 ossification centers are done. We also know that the spinal cord with its conus medullaris typically ends at the L3 level or higher. The conus medullaris, um, this is an example of the conus ending normally at about L2. Here is the conus ending at L3. Notice it has a sort of arrow-shaped or flame-shaped termination where it points to the uh, level of L3. And here are two examples of low insertion at L3 to 4 and here at L4 to 5. Now let's move on from normal anatomy or um, the beginning of this talk to miscellaneous spinal anomalies. And under this category, we're going to address abnormally shaped vertebrae, absent or dysplastic vertebrae, and kyphosis and scoliosis. This is an example of a patient referred for suspected spinal abnormality. And notice that there is a single thoracic hemivertebrae on these longitudinal clips and you can see the ossification center that is off axis compared to the other ossification centers. This is another subtle case where on the outside it was felt to represent an open spinal defect and here we can see on both the clips and the still images that the uh, posterior arch centers do not line up appropriately. The cord is deviated a little to one side and notice that these posterior arch centers do not oppose normally in the triangular shape. If you look at the longitudinal view, you can see the extra ossification and thickness and the malalignment at, related to this single isolated anomalous vertebrae at L1. Um, it is possible to have numerous dysplastic and anomalous vertebrae. Here is a, a fetus where uh, the diagnosis was totally missed outside and none of the visualized ossification centers line up normally on the longitudinal view. Here's another example of a proven case of costochondral dysplasia. And on this clip, you can see on the longitudinal view that there are numerous irregular ossification centers. We can see the abnormality on these fixed transverse views with the thickening and irregularity of the ribs. 
which do not align normally on a coronal view and appear uh, sort of wide-spaced and divergent on this axial view. Large segments of the spine may be absent, and that happens most frequently in sacral dysgenesis, dysgenesis cases where you can have totally absent vertebrae. This is a, a fetus that has an omphalocele, and you can see the abdominal wall defect anteriorly, as well as missing sacral vertebrae on this view at the level of the iliac crest. The conus medullaris ends low at approximately L5, below the normal termination level of L3 or above. Let's move on now to abnormal curvatures and kyphosis. The word kyphosis refers to abnormal forward angulation of the bony uh, structures at greater than 40 to 45 degrees. This is usually caused by fused uh, vertebrae that often are referred to as block vertebrae. It can also be associated with severe anomalies such as an open neural tube defect or spina bifida type case. Here's an example of um, a case of sharp kyphosis, and we can see that there's almost a 90-degree angle with the osseous structures here. On our 3D rendering, we notice that the spinal processes splay outwardly as we go more distally near the area of the sharp kyphosis. This fetus also had an abdominal wall defect with herniated bowel, at the base of the cord and polydactyly. On this clip, you can see that there's post-axial polydactyly with an extra digit adjacent to the fifth digit. So a uh, bony abnormality with a sharp kyphosis and open spinal defect and other anomalies. Scoliosis, in uh, distinction to kyphosis, refers to abnormal lateral spinal curvature. This could be right or left-sided or actually an S-shaped wave in both uh, uh, directions involving different spinal segments. In the fetal cases, scoliosis is usually caused by, again, a vertebral anomaly, and this can be absent bones, fused bones, or hemivertebrae. Neural tube defect is known to be associated in scoliosis uh, in about 60% of the cases. And it can also be seen in other uh, anomalies such as limb body wall complex, amniotic band syndrome, vector association, and so forth. This is an example of a fetus with severe scoliosis. You can see the marked curvature in the spine that again begins at about T9 or so and extends downward. These 2D images show you the abnormal curvature of the spine, and here we can see that the conus medullaris actually ends at a normal level at about L2. This was a case that was referred for an abdominal wall defect, and the scoliosis was completely missed. We can see that in this setting of oligohydramnios, there's marked curvature laterally of the spine beginning from the region of the cervical spine, there's associated ventricular megaly. Um, and on this clip, there is a large abdominal wall defect. We can see that there are herniated bowel loops outside of the abdominal cavity. This is the uh, cardiac activity in the region of the heart. Here's the region of the chest and the lungs. So marked spinal curvature, uh, scoliosis in a limb body wall complex case. Now let's move on to spina bifida, where we're going to spend most of our time because this is the most common central nervous system anomaly that's compatible with life. Uh, the open spinal defect uh, is the least severe of the uh, neural tube defects since anencephaly and cephalocele's are uh, much more difficult to manage and often not compatible with life. In the U.S., um, the incidence of spina bifida has remained relatively stable at about 1,500 cases a year, or 3.4 per 10,000 live births. Um, the vast majority of these cases are associated with uh, onocary two type malformations, uh, with hindbrain herniation, uh, an abnormal brain stream, and a very small and crowded posterior fossa. Live-born infants often have uh, hydrocephalus and other brain abnormalities with an estimated death rate of approximately 
The recognized causes of neural tube defects are so wide and variable, they can be grouped into categories, including um, maternal factors such as diabetes and a positive family history, as well as teratogens such as valproic acid, hy hypervitaminosis A. Um, neural tube defects may also be associated with chromosomal abnormalities, including trisomy 13, 18, and triploidy. The pathogenesis of neural tube defects is not completely understood, and there are two theories. One related to failure of rostral and caudal neural pore closure, and then another that theorizes that the neural tube actually closes. There is some insult, and then um, the tube reopens after its formation. A lot of what we have learned about uh, spina bifida and myelomeningocele, if you will, has been related to the correlation between the sheep and human models. Here's an example of a sheep that was evaluated with an artificially created spinal defect in a laboratory. And here, after birth, we can see that this uh, sheep has paralysis of the lower extremities, similar to this human uh, case of, again, a lumbosacral myelomeningocele and paralysis of the lower extremities after birth. The prenatal natural history of myelomeningocele is believed to be uh, after exposure of the neural elements to the non-sterile amniotic fluid, there is damage to the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. And this damage results in um, um, hindbrain herniation with associated central nervous system findings with tethering of the cord and the uh, open ex um, defect with exposure of the neural elements to the amniotic fluid, uh, ultimately causing paralysis, bowel and bladder um, abnormalities, orthopedic deformities, and so forth, with the severity of the lower limb deficits uh, directly related to the level of the spinal injury. Here's another graphic example of, again, a um, L5 to S1 myelomeningocele in a fetus with trauma continuing throughout um, the pregnancy until this is the appearance of the defect after birth. You can notice uh, how the lesion appears um, after um, additional weeks of exposure to the amniotic fluid. And here is a view of the newborn with uh, the lower extremity abnormalities uh, resulting from this further damage related to uh, the toxic effects of the amniotic fluid. Recently, uh, the MOMS trial, which uh, was entitled Management of MMC Study, was reported in the literature. This was an NIH-funded trial at three centers, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of California at San Francisco, and Vanderbilt, where over 1,000 women were screened for seven years. 183 women were ultimately randomized to pre- or postnatal therapy, and the trial was recently uh, stopped earlier this year due to proof of efficacy. The results were reported in the New England, Meta, uh, New England Journal of Medicine in February 2011, and uh, the results are very interesting. First off, the inclusion criteria were that these uh, women had to be residents of the United States. Um, they had to have a singleton pregnancy in the first trimester, 19 to less than 26 weeks. They had to have a myelomeningocele from T1 to S1, maternal age greater than 18 weeks, a normal carrier type, and evidence on ultrasound of hindbrain herniation. The exclusion criteria were if there were other anomalies, um, there were risks uh, of preterm birth, including abruption, or if the patients were morbidly obese with a high BMI. And finally, if there were surgical indications uh, contraindications due to uh, prior cesarean sections or surgery on the uterus itself. Here's an example of images showing exactly how the surgical procedure is uh, performed. Here we can see uh, the hysterectomy has been done, the lesion is uh, exposed. You can see the uh, myelomeningocele defect there. The sac has been opened, and we can see the opening in the spine. This, these images are showing the defect with the closure, 
and um, here is what the fetus looks like after delivery with the postnatal closure site that you can see there. The reason the trial was stopped is that uh, as the preliminary results were being analyzed, it became clear that the outcome for prenatal therapy was better than postnatal therapy, and um, the uh, newborns were followed at 12 and 30 months, and uh, pre the uh, fetuses that underwent prenatal treatment, 36% had no uh, hindbrain herniation at birth compared to only 4% of the postnatal group. 32% had improved lower extremity function, two levels or greater compared to 12% of the postnatal group. 42% could walk independently compared to 21% of the postnatal group. And 40% um, uh, required uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt placement compared to 82% of the postnatally randomized group. Here's an example of uh, the human fetal MNC repair, and this is a diagram showing the herniated spinal contents and after surgery how um, the contents are returned to the spinal canal and the repair is done. And the theory is that um, there is reversal of the hindbrain herniation with the cerebellar tonsils returning to a more normal position in the posterior fossa after release of the neural placode and repair of the open spinal defect. This is um, just an article from the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, published in February of this year. Um, and uh, this is an 11-year-old who was one of our first fetal repair um, cases at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And this young lady can um, do aerobics, and uh, she takes dance, and her only limitations are that she has to wear her braces uh, several times per week. So let's look at what ultrasound, um, the role that ultrasound played in the analysis of these patients. What did we do for the spinal assessment? First off, we had to determine the level of the defect. We needed to visualize the conus medullaris, measure the sac and the skin defect, characterize its contents. Was the sac purely cystic or did it contain neural elements? Evaluate for other neural axis anomalies and evaluate the lower extremities for movement from the hips to the toes. On this slide, this is an example of how we determine the level of the defect. This is a myelomeningocele case using a 12 megahertz transducer. We can see ribs 10, 11, and 12, and then count the ossification centers for the lumbar spine. So we can see that this defect starts exactly at L2, counting down, and extends all the way to the end of the uh, sacrum at approximately S4. This is a view showing the conus medullaris ending at the level of the defect with the cord tethered to the site of the abnormality. On this axial or transverse view, we can see the wide splaying of the posterior arches and the thin little membrane covering the defect. This is a cine clip showing another case where we can see that we measure the uh, size of the myelomeningocele sac in three dimensions, AP and length on the sagittal view and uh, width on the transverse view. This shows the neural elements extending into the sac and they appear as solid, usually linear uh, structures in this area of a cystic sac with um, CSL fluid. This is an example of what we do for the lower extremity evaluation. This is a fetus that is actually playing with the paralyzed lower extremities. These are the hands touching the feet. Compared to this normal case where there is flexion and extension at the hip, the knee, and the ankle joint in this fetus who's being stimulated. One clue to a possible lower extremity abnormality is, is if the lower extremities remain crossed uh, throughout uh, the examination for uh, more than an hour or so. That's generally a tip-off that we are not getting normal spontaneous movement and there may be talipes. Here's an example of a more severe case of talipes showing the muscular atrophy and thinning of the soft tissues um, involving the lower leg. Here we can see the foreleg. This is the area of the ankle on this 3D view, and we can see the toes point pointing towards 
the foot a very abnormal appearance in a fetus that was difficult to evaluate due to the breech presentation. We can see the spinal defect here in the lower lumbosacral spine region. And this is actually a transvaginal scan showing the measurement of the wide defect that measured over two centimeters. It is possible to classify spina bifida uh, a number of different ways. Spina bifida occulta generally refers to a subtle abnormality that we often can see on x-rays. Sometimes these are not detected until adult life. And in some newborns, these can, these can present as a sacral dimple or hair tuft. Generally, these patients will have a normal cord and nerves. Spina bifida cystica, on the other hand, refers to the open defects, which contain either uh, CSF fluid only without neural elements in the rare meningocele, or more commonly, uh, neural elements and uh, cerebral spinal fluid in the typical myeloid meningocele. Now let's look at the occult spinal cases first. There are various uh, types of occult defects, ranging from the tethered cord to lipoma cyst, a split cord, or a myelocystocele, and we'll look at some examples. The tethered cord typically refers to the fact that the spinal cord is attached to the surrounding tissues of the back. This most often occurs, as you've seen in examples shown before now, in the open neural tube de de defect cases. But it can also be seen in lipomas, sacrococcygeal teratomas, and other types of structural abnormalities. Again, here's an example of a tethered cord with the conus medullaris and its flame shape or arrowed shape ending at L5. And here's another example with, again, the conus medullaris, its flame shape ending at approximately L3 to 4, which is lower than expected. This is an example of a tethered cord. This patient was referred in for a possible open neural tube defect, and we can see that there is thickening of the skins and a calcified echogenic focus in the soft tissues of the subcutaneous area of this fetus. Uh, we can see that the cord is tethered and ends at about um, L4, but that this is not an open neural tube defect, and it was easily repaired after birth, and uh, the cord was released uh, with a good outcome. Diastomatomyelia refers to a quote-unquote split cord or a division of the spinal cord into two hemichords. These usually have two dural sacs, and it can occur because of a bony spur, a cartilaginous septum, or even a band. Clefting can invo involve the cord, the conus medullaris, or the final phylum terminale. This most often occurs in open neural tube defects and is much easier to visualize with MR than with ultrasound. Here's an example of a split cord, if you will, with two sacs. Here is fluid here and here's fluid there, and you can see the split. This is the cord coming down going to one sac, and here's the other portion of the cord coming down. And we can see a view of the two split sacs on um, this scan, and interestingly, in this case, there was no evidence of ventricular megaly or Arnold Chieri type malformation or, or hindbrain herniation, if you will. Here's another example with, um, again, a split cord where we can see the fibers of the spinal cord coming down and splitting into two in the lumbosacral area. Again, a coronal view showing the fluid separating the spine there into two. Uh, specific hemichords, in this case of an open neural tube defect or myelomeningocele. This is an interesting case of a high thoracic uh, lesion. This is in the thoracolumbar spine. We can see that there is a bony spur in the middle of the cord here that we can see on the clip. This is a view showing the cord split around the bony spur. And here is at the level of the defect. We can see that there is also an open spinal defect with the skin covering with a thin membrane here. And this is a view showing the wide splaying of the posterior arches and the bony bridge here. Wide splaying of the posterior arches, a thin little membrane. So this was a thoracolumbar myelomeningocele associated with diastomatomyelia. Finally, for... Um, Terminal myelocystocele, this is a very rare occult spinal defect that occurs typically in the lumbosacral region. It can be isolated 
or associated with the OEI complex. Generally, there's a large um, ependymal-lined terminal cyst, often with overlying skin and thickening, and the cord is usually tethered to the site of the defect. The, these types of lesions cannot be detected with uh, maternal serum and amniocentesis testing, as the AFP and the ACE are often uh, normal. Why is differentiation with the myelomeningocele important? Um, the prognosis in these cases is usually excellent with good intellectual and neuromuscular function. It is a sporadic defect, and so there is not a high recurrence risk with other open um, spinal defects. Um, counseling is also important to determine if the patients were on any medications or possible teratogens which can be associated with a terminal myelocystocele. Here was a case of a myelocystocele that was surgically repaired at Children's Hospital. We can see that there is a cystic mass, very thick wall with an echogenic appearing uh, component and notice that there is no hindbrain herniation. The cerebellum has a normal configuration, and there's fluid in the region of the cisterna magna. This case was originally referred in as an echogenic mass, possibly a sacral coccygeal teratoma, but in fact, it was proven to represent a terminal myelocystocele, and there was uh, lipomatous tissue uh, associated with this. Now let's move on to the other classification of spina bifida, Rather than just um, um, the occult versus the um, obvious lesion, spina bifida can be classified as cystica. Um, and in the cystica cases, it can be either meningocele or myelomeningocele. In meningocele, the contents of the sac is generally fluid and meninges, and so it appears very uh, cystic in appearance. The spinal cord and the nerve roots are typically normal. In the myelocystocele, there's more of a solid component because neural elements are present, and these cases are virtually always associated with tethered cord and Anokieri II malformation or hindbrain herniation. Here's an example of a meningocele where the sac is evident on these images, and notice that there is fluid with no solid components visualized. There is rounding of the cerebellum, but a very thin area of about two millimeters of narrowing with residual fluid, a very small amount, left in the region of the cisterna magna, which was not totally effaced. Also notice that you can see fluid in the uh, regions of the subarachnoid space, which was not completely crowded and effaced as well. This is a much more typical myelomeningocele, and on this clip we can see the solid elements extending into the large myelomeningocele sac. Again, the anechoic areas represents cerebral spinal fluid, and the more solid elements represent the neural tissues with the cord tethered to the site of the defect, which we can see here on this static image. These are two axial images showing that the bony defect is generally about a level or two above the level of the uh, skin defect. Here are the two posterior neural arches, and they are gradually opposed, but at this level, the skin and muscle appears to be closed. And then one level down, we can see we're at the level of the soft tissue defect, where there is a frank opening with exposure of the tissues to the amniotic fluid. Spina bifida can be classified as these are closed in approximately 20% which means these cases are skin-covered or have a thick, opaque membrane. Again, these are usually detected only by imaging and not with a screening of serum. And then the open defects, which are much more common, 80%, that are either uncovered or um, um, covered by a very thin, translucent uh, membrane. In these cases, there is direct communication, again, of the spinal contents with the amniotic fluid, and these can be readily detected on maternal serum screening and on amniocentesis. Here's an example of a closed spinal defect that is actually skin covered. And we can see as we go down from S1 to S2 that um, there is a thick covering of the skin. Here we can see the abnormal appearance of the cord which goes into the area of the small defect. But again, um, the 
covering of the skin is protective, and so this type of defect could not be discovered just on routine uh, maternal serum screening. This is an example of a more typical open spinal defect from L2 to S4. We use the term myeloschisis to refer to this type of opening in which the defect is very flat. There is no measurable sac. There is basically um, just a hole where the spinal tissues did not converge normally. And if you notice these actual views here at L1, the posterior arches are closely opposed. They start to gradually separate at L2 with a subtle bony defect, a little bit more separated at L3, and then more widely splayed at L4 at the level of the skin defect. Open spinal defects, the vast majority tend to occur in the lumbar region, 73%. 17% in the sacrum, 9% in the thorax, and 1% in the cervical region. Here's an example of a thoracic myelomeningocele, and we can see on this cine clip that there is a uh, sac in the thoracic region with reconstitution of the soft tissues and the skin in the region of the lower lumbar and sacral spine. We can see the degree of hindbrain herniation with a rounded uh, cerebellum that completely effaces the cisterna magna, and we can also see the degree of ventricular megaly with uh, the dangling cord plexus on this clip. Um, and here is the degree of ventricular megaly. Notice that the lower extremities still display very normal spontaneous motion without evidence of talipes. Cervical myelomeningoceles are very rare, and here's an example of such a case showing that there is a defect in the upper spine in the region of the cervix. We can see this large defect measured here, and in addition, there is a cystic malformation involving the cord itself, and here we can see the spinal cord. So this was a cervical cord syrinx associated with a rare cervical myelomeningocele. This is the same patient showing a more axial view with a defect extending from C7 to T1. And here on this view, we can see the covering and the large defect. And at this region, we can see the cystic area of the syrinx. Notice that there is complete hindbrain herniation with the cerebellar tonsils extending into the cervical spine region. There is severe cerebral ventricular megaly measuring uh, 2.8 to 2.5 centimeters with a dangling cord plexus. And here is the region of the uh, conus medullaris, interestingly, that ended at L2 to 3 in the normal level. Um, there are known to be cranial findings associated with open spinal defects, and these range from ventricular megaly to the fruit signs, lemon and banana, uh, cisterna magna effacement, or Anokieri II malformation, if you will. Another term is hindbrain herniation, and if that is severe, there can also be associated microcephaly. This is an example to illustrate the importance of trying to visualize both lateral cerebral ventricles. The uh, up ventricle, if you will, or the non-dependent ventricle often can be filled with uh, electronic noise. But here we can see that the uh, left ventricle, which was non-dependent, measured 13 millimeters compared to the dependent right ventricle, which only measured 10 millimeters. This is another case of myeloschisis. We can see that there is a flattened defect without a well-defined sac. On this axial view, splaying of the posterior arches with a thin covering membrane. This is an example of the lemon sign, which refers to concave frontal bones. And here we can see the lemony appearance of the frontal bones. Interesting in this case, in that there was no ventricular megaly. The ventricles both measured um, less than 8 millimeters. The spinal cord was tethered to the site of the defect that we see here. And again, here we can see that this was a low sacral lesion. Uh, without ventricular megaly, but with a nice lemon sign. So what is the value of the uh, signs in the brain? Normal cerebral ventricles and the spine on an outside scan. If you see the fruit signs, it means that we must go back and do a much more detailed evaluation to try to pick up a very subtle abnormality. Here is a case showing the ventricles that are measuring 5 millimeters. There is frontal bone concavity with the lemon sign and the abnormal curvature of the cerebellum 
with the banana sign. In a case such as this, we would need to go and do an extremely detailed evaluation of the spine all the way to the very lower spine to make sure that any potential uh, lesion was discovered. And here is a case of where the S4 lesion is so low and so subtle that what led to uh, a second opinion searching for the abnormality was the persistence of the uh, CNS findings. And here on this clip, if you follow it down, you can see how the spine looks formed. Normally, the posterior arches are relatively well opposed. Uh, however, when we get to the very, very lower area of the sacrum, we can see the divot in the soft tissues and a tiny little cystic abnormality here that is indicated here by this arrow. Here is the subtle splaying of the posterior arches there. And here is a view using a 12 megahertz transducer showing the uh, conus medullaris tethered to the site of the defect. A very low sacral lesion with subtle uh, CNS findings which tipped us off to search diligently for the correct diagnosis which was missed on the outside scan. What are the accuracies of these um, um, markers in the brain? The lemon sign is extremely sensitive, as is the abnormal cerebellar or banana sign. However, the posterior fossa is more valuable because the abnormal cerebellum tends to remain throughout the gestation whereas a lemon sign may convert as the skull and cranial tissues mature, and therefore it has been reported that in the later third trimester, later second and third trimester, that a lot of cases will not necessarily have the lemon sign, but will have the banana sign due to the abnormal crowding of the posterior fossa and the hindbrain herniation associated with myelomeningocele. This is an example of pseudomicrocephaly in a case with severe hindbrain herniation. And here we can see that the ventricles, again, were just at the number of 10. Uh, the chart shows the BPD was two standard deviations below the mean. Due to the severe degree of hindbrain herniation, this is a coronal view showing the cerebellar uh, tonsils uh, downward. This is a view showing the inability to oppose the two posterior arches with this subtle uh, variation due to um, a little scoliosis at the area of the defect, and you can see the curvature. This is the cord tethered to the site of the defect, but due to the degree of hindbrain herniation, the head measurements did not fall within the expected normal range. Let's move on to the prognostic factors associated with uh, spinal defects, specifically open spinal defects. Um, there can be other associated anomalies involving other organ systems, uh, and it is important to note this for the counseling of the parents. It is also important to determine, as we have previously discussed, the location and the size of the defect, characterize it as open and closed or closed, and evaluate the degree of ventricular megaly or hydrocephalus for um, pregnancy management. This is an example, another case of kyphoscoliosis uh, associated with an open spinal defect. Here we can see the thin covering membrane, the abnormal cerebellum with the banana shape, and notice that, again, the ventricles measured within the range of normal at 9 and 10 millimeters, and the choroid plexus actually touches the lateral and medial ventricular wall, but there were other associated anomalies. Here is a clip, again, showing that kyphoscoliosis. Notice that there's a grossly abnormal left hand with persistent flexion at the wrist, and there is severe bilateral talipes with the legs crossed at the ankles with no uh, spontaneous motion and atrophy of the muscles of the lower leg. This is another example of a myelomeningocele with a number of associated abnormalities. Here we can see the large myelomeningocele sac, both on the longitudinal and the axial view, measured in all three planes. The associated hindbrain herniation with the abnormal appearing cerebellum. The ventricles, again, are just at the magic number of 10. But here we can see the herniated tonsils and the step off of the cervical vertebrae. There was an associated widening of the cervical canal due to a syrinx of the cervical cord.
Let's end up now with sacral coccygeal teratoma, which is a rare tumor that arises from the cells of the coccyx. It can occur in association with neural tube defects or other spinal abnormalities. Histologically, there are four different types, one to four, and most masses tend to be solid uh, or complex. A tip-off is if you see focal calcifications and those mixed in with cystic components, as well as vascular flow on color Doppler can help make the diagnosis. There are complications with these tumors, particularly cardiovascular compromise resulting in non-immune high drops due to vascular steel from the solid components of these lesions. Here is a table showing the SCT calcification. The type 1 lesions are predominantly external with only a small presacral component. Type 2 lesions have a little bit more external component, but type 3 tends to be uh, predominantly internal, and the rare type 4 is entirely internal. So let's look at some examples. Here's a large, predominantly solid and hypervascular type 1 lesion. This color Doppler shows flow from uh, the iliac arteries feeding this very large, complex lesion that has a few scattered cystic components but is solid for the most part. The vascular steel, in this case, resulted in cardiac compromise with a dilated inferior vena cava and these are 3D renderings here showing the large mass with the appearance that looks like the fetus sitting on a basketball. What are prognostic factors that influence the outcome in SCT patients? Large solid hypervascular lesions put the fetuses at greatest risk. Um, children's uh, hospital reviewed their SCT patients a few years ago and uh, looked at about 30 fetuses that we examined over an eight-year period and noticed that the complications developed in about 80% of the cases, polyhydramnias, there can be too much fluid, oligohydramnias, too little fluid, preterm labor was a problem as well as preeclampsia and so forth as you see listed here. Um, of the um, 30 uh, cases, we actually did in utero surgery on three, and three survived after uh, intervention. There were six cases that were predominantly cystic and were treated with cyst aspiration, amnio reduction, or amnio infusion. Here's an example of a patient that's at significant risk of developing non-immune high drops due to a large type 1 predominantly solid sacrococcygeal teratoma. And here on these 3D images, we can see the uh, lesion in the region of the buttocks here and here. For our sonographic assessment of these tumors, what we do is we evaluate the placenta to uh, assess for possible placenta megaly. We look at the amniotic fluid for either too much or too little fluid and measure both um, the amniotic fluid index and the deepest vertical pocket. We search for additional signs of non-immune high drops. We uh, classify the SCT as to types 1 to 4. We measure the volume of the mass using the formula for a prolate ellipse, and that is width times length times height times 0.523. We look at the echo texture of the lesion and try to characterize that as predominantly uh, complex, solid, or cystic. We assess the vascularity with color Doppler, and we evaluate uh, the umbilical artery, including the uh, uh, umbilical vein and the ductus venosus, again, for tip-offs of, of any compromise. Here's an example of a very extensive type 3 sacrococcygeal teratoma. Here we can see that there's wide splaying of the bones of the lower pelvis. Um, here, this mass extends internally, and we can see that there's associated acidic fluid here. The mass effect pushes the liver up, and notice on power Doppler, there's extensive vascular flow to this patient who presented with non-immune high drops and severe oligohydramnios. This is the corresponding MRI that shows this huge lesion and um, the uh, lack of oligohydramnios, lack of amniotic fluid in this case with oligohydramnios. What other complications can be associated, associated with uh, SCT besides non-immune high drops? And that includes a thickening of the placenta, uh, again oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios without frank non-immune high drops, 
Uh, we look for signs of cardiovascular compromise. The uh, mother can actually start to mirror the fetal sin symptoms and actually get maternal mirror syndrome with swelling of the ankles and cardiovascular compromise. And uh, there can be specific complications associated with the mass effect of the tumor or the overall tumor volume. Here's another case of a solid hypervascular type 1 sacrococcygeal teratoma that is predominantly external and uh, again with significant vascular steel on power Doppler. Here we can see the aorta and the vessels supplying this mass. Here we can see it's predominantly solid. Notice the uh, distended uh, inferior vena cava and the finding of polyhydramnios with fluid pockets greater than uh, 9 centimeters. Uh, anomalies that can be associated with SCT volume specifically involve the uh, genital urinary tract, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, pulmonary hypoplasia can develop, musculoskeletal abnormalities such as club foot and hip dislocation, and central nervous system complications including invasion of the spinal cord by the um, enlarging mass. This is an example of a large solid type 2 SCT. We can see that there is a very large external component, but also uh, an element of an internal component bigger than in the type 1 sort of lesions. Color Doppler shows the vascular flow to this lesion, and if you look on this view, there is a solid sheath of tissue extending into the area of the spinal canal due to spinal cord uh, involvement. We can prove this by turning on color Doppler and you can see that there's a large blood vessel extending into the region of the spinal cord and spectral analysis of that vessel shows that there's clear vascular flow extending into the region of the spinal canal with intrathecal flow uh, definitively diagnosing spinal cord invasion by this large SCT. <clears throat> this is a CT, that, an SCT that has much more internal component. This is a type 3 and we can see that vessels are displaced. The mass extends high into the abdomen out of the true pelvis. This is the obstructed uterus and we can see that it is filled with debris. There is acidic fluid and here is a large mass uh, pressing on the region of the cervix in the lower uterine segment obstructing the uterus due specifically to volume. These are additional images on that same patient showing bilateral um, Hydro uh, nephrosis with thinning of the cortex and ballooning of the calyces. We can see here that the mass presses on the bladder, which is distended, and extends up to the level of the gallbladder. Here again, we see the volume of this large mass, which measures five by six centimeters on some views. Another view showing the extension of the mass with the complex cystic and solid components extending up to the level of the liver and the gallbladder. And here on this view, vascular flow in the region of the sacrum indicating intrathecal growth into the region of the spinal canal due to invasion by this very large uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma. This is a rare type 4 lesion with uh, massive abdominal distension due to the fact that the tumor is entirely internal in location. And this view shows that this is not acidic fluid with floating bowel, but this is the entire mass with both a cystic and solid component. And here you can see the solid components with a large, more peripheral cystic component. You can see that the diaphragm is elevated. The lungs are compressed with this huge type 4 SCT lesion. There's no therapy that can be done, really, for the type 3 and type 4 lesions due to the mass volume of these lesions and the internal location. Type 1 lesions can be treated various ways. Here is a type 1 lesion that is predominantly cystic. On this uh, power Doppler image, you can see that fluid uh, goes from one locule into the next locule, and this patient with thick nodular septations were managed uh, was managed by having uh, fluid drained from these various cystic components as the mass enlarged and in preparation for delivery um, in order that uh, there would be less of a mass effect to have to deal with at the time of delivery uh, due to decompression of these cystic spaces by aspiration with multiple attempts. Here's another patient that was aspirated 
um, serial times as the pregnancy was managed. Here we can see on this clip that there is a cystic mass extending off laterally, and here's another view showing the cystic mass that had minimal solid components and was managed with serial aspirations uh, prior to delivery. In conclusion, I believe that uh, sonography of the spine um, is a very important uh, area in uh, fetal anomaly diagnosis. We can make many specific diagnoses now using the high frequency probes that are available with the latest equipment. And here is one of our fetuses that is smiling because um, uh, he was able to survive after appropriate uh, counseling and management of his spinal defect. Thank you for your attention.